I'm Connor Roll and welcome back to another episode of Forgotten Oscar Films. And this week we're actually skipping a year. We're not going to 1975, we're going at the class of 1974 movies. And this week we're talking about the huge box office hit disaster movie starring an all-star cast, The Towering Inferno. So if you're new to the series, what I do every single week is I go year from year, um, starting with 1988 and working backwards of looking at the best picture nominees for the Oscars of that year. Last week we did 1976. Um, uh, uh, we skipped 1975 because there's too many great classics. Um, but now we're in 1974. And I look at the Best Picture uh, nominee class and I choose a film that I've never, not, either never heard of or haven't heard a lot about and maybe has sort of been forgotten or not as well remembered as some of the other best sort of picture nominees. And these are some of the best movies of the time. So I figured I'd go back and see some of them. According to the Oscars at the time, according to the Academy, what were some of the best movies at the time that they considered. Um, I also talk about sort of the Oscar histories of that year. So if you're an Oscar fan, stay tuned, but also so I talk about some of my thoughts and then sort of a uh, critical analysis of maybe why this has been forgotten. Why is this sort of a movie that hasn't held up compared to some of the other Best Picture nominees or um, other films of that year uh, that have. Um, and this is actually a really great year. Uh, I almost skipped this year too. Um, but last year, the last um, year, uh, year 1975 was really good. 1976 was good, except for Bound for Glory. You know, I'm always finding, you know, the 70s have been pretty good in terms of m nominating movies that um, were nominated for Best Picture were also big hits. Um, that's always sort of the, crit the analysis that I'm trying to think of is that, you know, are the academies really just being, are they so out of touch nowadays? Because back in the day, they're always nominating the biggest box office hits. Is that the reason? Or is it because audience scores aren't going to these sort of more adult dramas. You know, The Godfather was a huge hit. Uh, the Towering Firm was a, a, a huge hit and a, a critical thing. It seems nowadays very much split between being a huge hit and being a critical darling. It's very interesting that way. I'm not, it's hard, I'm not sure if it's the audience's movie taste that have changed or is it that the Academy that's sort of uh, choosing sort of odd, stranger, more independent movies compared to, you know, something like a uh, uh, Black Panther. But I think that they have been doing that, you know, with Black Panther, with Get Out, um, with these movies that have been doing very well and are also very well critically acclaimed, acclaimed, they are getting more nominations. So I think that's a good sign for the future for the Academy. But enough of that, starting with the five nominees, um, this is a great year. First, you got The Godfather Part Two, of course, an obvious classic. Some people think it's better than the first Godfather, which is seen as one of the best movies of all time. I know a lot of people have seen The Godfather, but maybe have skipped out on Godfather 2. Definitely, definitely check it out. It won't let you down, of course. Um, and then also another movie directed by Francis Ford Coppola um, was nominated, The Conversation, um, which I think is still sort of a, a, a popular film just because it is directed by Francis, Francis Ford Coppola in this period of time um, that he's just on fire. The same year as Godfather 2, two years after Godfather 1, Apocalypse Now is coming soon. You know, it's really this sort of beautiful period and in, in a peak period and maybe any filmmaker's career ever um, and the conversation if you haven't seen it, is a really fantastic film a, a perfect paranoid thriller and I think it's one of those people one of those movies that you do discover ultimately just because it's like oh what's the best movie of all time okay some people say The Godfather you check out The Godfather then you check out Godfather 2 then you check out some of his other films Apocalypse Now then you get around to seeing the conversation I think there's a, a realistic trajectory that I didn't want to cover the conversation despite me loving it a lot um, another army is Chinatown uh, this is taught in film schools still today uh, sort of its perfect screenplay and how it hits its beats um, and you know classic Jack Nicholson performance another great movie I've already seen um, so I didn't want to cover that one so really we had two Two options. We had Lenny um, and The Towering Inferno. And uh, I recently covered uh, Lenny, uh, which is directed by Bob Fosse, and I recently covered uh, one of his movies, All That Jazz. So I, I try to stay away from doing double directors, uh, especially some sort of iconic and, and distinctive as Bob Fosse. So I ended up going with uh, The Towering Inferno. And I'm really interested to do it because there's a great history behind um, this movie, less with the Oscars, which is sort of, we always we we'll look at the Oscars, but also sort of the culture and the movie going state at the time, which is why I enjoy this show so much. And actually, this is a really unique time because this genre, really the Tower of Inferno belongs to the disaster movie genre, but there's a specific point of time, sort of, I guess you would maybe even call it the disaster movie, Golden Age, um, that I was really uh, unaware of. And these certain types of movies that have sort of transformed and morphed into what we see today, but are still very different. Um, these are the sort of uh, 70s disaster movies. Um, so this is a time um, starting with 19 Airport in 1970, um, which was a huge hit and, and a disaster movie. You know, really there has been previous disaster movies, things like King Kong and whatnot, but similarly with Evil Dead, uh, we talked about with Sam Raimi and the horror comedy, uh, this, this movie is a sort of defining of its genre. Um, a lot of people 
would say this movie has the best of a genre, but definitely if some people look at airport in 1970 and sort of can categorize that decade of being um, very much an auteur decade, very much sort of this is an astro movie desk decade because the increase in special effects and because of this formula that, that they've created, um, these big, long, loud, all-star star cat, uh, all-star study casts, um, and some of them will die. You don't know who's going to die and who's going to make it out. And, and it's really fun that way. Um, so starting with Airport 1970, it was a huge hit. Got nominated for Best Picture. I was going to cover that one, but I decided to cover this one here. Um, so that, that was a huge hit. Then in 1972, uh, Poseidon. Uh, it, um, it was also a huge hit uh, a couple years later, and then this was really the peak year for disaster movies. You had um, Towering Inferno, you had Earthquake, and then you had Airplane 75, um, which was the sequel to, uh, sorry, Airport 75. There's a sequel to Airport 70 in, in 1970. It's weird because they call it the year. It's strange, um, but, uh, well, the year before, so it's kind of confusing. Anyways, so those three films um, were actually huge successes. This one being the biggest of them all. And I mean, not just for inflation, I think they're making somewhere of like 700, 800 million dollars a towering furrow. Earthquake made 500 plus, you know, like these were not only huge successes um, in box office wise, they were critical. I mean, it got nominated for best picture. And like I said before, the genre has definitely morphed. I mean, there was sort of a, a boom of the genre in the, in the 90s with Independence Day and Armageddon and Deep Impact and of course those kinds of movies. But I think now, Everyone sort of wants that big movie because they know it's going to start sort of a, a genre, but we're always waiting to see what it is. You know, we, we still get some movies. You know, we got Skyscraper, which is very reminiscent of this film. We had um, San Andreas, both The Rock. Um, then we had something like Geostorm, you know, the Roland Emmerich films. He's still trying to make those kind of movies. Um, and they are semi-successful. They're not hugely successful, but I think they, they make their money back. Um, but they're not sort of these ones that really start a huge new movement of these disaster movies. Um, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, back then, you know, it, it, you could have these stars and, and that's enough. But nowadays, you know, people just want to be signed on to a disaster movie, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean um, it's going to make money or whatnot. But they still, even though, you know, in a time dominated by IPs and whatnot, the disaster movie still holds up in a lot of ways. Um, but this is sort of a genre that was actually spoofed in the movie Airplane, of course, um, you know, in a classic comedy. But when I watched Airplane for the first time, I had really no recollection and no uh, sort of reference for the genre at all, what it was spoofing. I didn't even realize Airplane was a spoof movie because I sort of had um, no context of these 70s disaster movies. And I think that actually happens to a lot of people. And that's a con uh, con uh, sort of a a testament to how great airplane is that uh, surpasses these sort of um, movies. But these airports or airplane uh, big disaster movies had these sort of tropes and were making money and getting the best picture. That's actually a spoof movie. Um, so, but it's actually interesting to see how this genre has died off and the spoof movie has actually succeeded. Um, so that, that's just sort of how the genre has played, I think, over. And I think that's, I'm not the only one who would, who would say that. Um, and, and really the only sort of comparison of the sort of a lush genre, but still sort of being around today, would almost be like the sort of the teen dystopian f fantasy, you know, in 2008, and you know, we had Twilight, and then we got Divergent, and uh, Hunger Games, and even Harry, Harry Potter sort of fell into that trap a bit to the later ones. Um, of these sort of this specific genre that has largely gone away um, um, today, at least, you know, people could say the superhero genre, but the superheroes have been around since the 70s. I mean, the teen dystopian fiction was really sort of this very specific genre that, you know, if I saw someone with a Twilight tattoo or whatever, I'd be kind of strange. You know, Twilight hasn't actually stayed in the pop culture as, as much as we thought, especially, you know, someone like um, they cast Robert Pattinson for Batman, even though he was sort of a big Edward Cullen, he has sort of transcended that, just being a great actor. He hasn't really been typecast. He can actually play now another um, huge, really important character to a lot of people, inclu including myself. Um, so that's sort of th that, um, uh, you know, Godfather Part Two ended up winning Best Picture. Kind of a, a boring year for Oscars that way because it was sort of Godfather Part Two or Chinatown, and Godfather Part Two just sort of swept away with it, winning a lot of awards. Um, and The Towering Inferno actually won more than, I think, uh, Chinatown and um, uh, Lenny and um, the conversation. So that's kind of interesting because it had a f sound and effects and whatnot.
Uh, so transitioning to my thoughts, I'll, I'll make this brief. Um, I enjoy the movie, it's, it's entertaining, but I'm not sure um, if it'll keep your uh, interest for the entire time. Um, it's definitely a slick movie, uh, sort of like an Ocean's Eleven style, um, how they malt sort of these crane uh, uh, operate cameras, the camera movements are for a slower, but still sort of gliding on a smooth, nothing sort of shaking, even in sort of the most uh, sort of dangerous situations. The, calm, the camera always stays calm and almost sort of omniscient in a lot of ways and just sort of how it moves and glides. There's a lot of gliding in this movie throughout sort of the scenes and you go from one famous person to the next and there's parties and it's very sort of fancy and very slick in that sense. Um, but I also found it um, uh, slow in a lot of ways because you know, I look at a movie like Booksmart and that has rapid, fast editing and sort of keeps your attention and there's sort of a certain pace. And I, I look at that as sort of being the future kind of of pacing and how people consume media and especially movies. I'm um, not that something like a movie like First Reform, for example, couldn't exist um, because I really enjoy that movie and that's a very slow movie. But this one definitely for being two hours and 45 minutes and sort of a big entertaining disaster movie, you'd expect it to be maybe a little bit more entertaining, maybe a little, go, a little bit more faster. They definitely stretch out sort of this what if scenario because there's so many people and I think they want to give everyone so much s s amount of screen time, um, but then it sort of feels a little bit bloated, and that, that's something I recognize with all, you know certain '70s movies that, that 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 do feel sort of okay, even though they're sort of have a different pace. You have to understand that. But for being like a disaster movie, I just felt that maybe my expectations, and maybe, that, maybe that's sort of my modern viewpoint looking back on it, that maybe it should have been a little bit more faster, a little bit uh, tighter. Um, the effects still held up really well. I enjoy that. Like I said, it's very entertaining. I forget how sort of cool Steve McQueen and Paul Newman are in this film. They're just so cool. Um, there was a sort of a tinge, though, of it being sort of sadistic in the way that sort of these they die. Like in disaster movies, some people, not a lot of people die, and if they do, they're sort of these offhand characters. Like some stars and some people died, and they had like extensive death sequences where they're running around on fire and they're jumping in the buildings. And oh my god! And like, the, you know, that's sort of a certain thing of the genre. I think that's sort of left away, and it almost takes a sort of a sadistic Sadistic joy in it, and I kind of get it. You know, seeing these big stars be all rich, and then they come to their own demise and die in that sense, and they sort of get what they deserve. Um, but also, sort of, I think maybe the film enjoys it a little bit too much. And I was kind of like, why are we holding on this shot of this person dying for so long? Like, it's kind of disturbing, right? Um, but this film really doesn't deal with death in that way. No one really reacts to deaths too too much. They're very much sort of. Well, we're still in this building, so we need to get out. Uh, so that kind of makes sense, um, but still, you have to keep that in mind. So entertaining, but a little bit slow, slick, got some great stars, um, and actually, the, the, the special effects, there's no real CGI, there's all practical effects, explosions, fires, things like that, actually hold up really well. Um, now, I was impressed by how well they did. Um, so maybe, so answer the question is why doesn't this hold up? Um, the effects hold up well, but maybe it's, it doesn't translate because you know these are big home movie spectacles where they don't translate as well on the small screen, which is how most people consume media today, of course. Um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's a very long film, so it's hard just to flip on. Um, you know, while uh, the movie's stock full of big stars, um, stars are very much sort of a generational thing. You know, if this movie had Tom Cruise and The Rock and Amy Adams and all these my favorite actors, right, I'd be there day one and I'd love it and I'd love it until I was 70 because those are sort of my guys right now and th those are the guys who I really followed and I fell, uh, helped me fall in love with movies because of the, sort of the modern ones. You know, Paul Newman, Faye Dunaway, these amazing actors um, who I've I have to. You have to sort of learn to know about them and learn about their movies and fall in love with them because their movies are older and they're not obviously alive today or they're older, so they're not making sort of starring vehicles anymore. Um, so in that sense, you know, they don't have like sort of a, a seminal start. Like they have these really big stars, but first of all, you have to be a film fan to learn about you know Bullet and Cool Hand Luke, um, to, to like um, you know, Steve McQueen and Paul Newman, and then you'll enjoy the movie. And I think that really helps because otherwise they're just like, oh look, it's that person, it's Richard Chamberlain, you know, um, and then you'd be like, who? Oh, he was a TV star in, in the seventies. You know, that, so the, some things definitely are lost um, that maybe they weren't at the time. So that keeps it sort of dated. Um, but overall, I enjoyed the movie. Uh, maybe not a super high recommend for me, but it's definitely one that if you want to check out uh, uh, sort of good disaster movies, in, especially in the seventies, and get some of the airplane references, this one will definitely work in that favor. But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Tell me what to watch for next week, 1973. Um, there's a couple options there. Um, that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And until next time, stay tuned.